Chapter 5 Guy to the Rescue Soon afterwards, the entire gang of convicts was split up and sold off to various people who wanted cheap labour. In those days, besides the poor African slaves who were being bought from the Ivory Coast in increasing numbers, it was usual to transport criminals to the American colonies to do heavy labour. These wretches were no more than slaves themselves. With Riach and Alistair McLeod, Guy was bound out to a tobacco planter named Gervais Holly, who owned a big estate on the Roanoke River in the neighbouring colony of North Carolina. To their disgust, Exxon and his two evil henchmen went with them. After a long march along muddy trails, through swamps and low-lying meadows, they arrived at their new home one evening in late April. They soon found that a plantation hand's life was hard indeed, hoeing the rows of tobacco from dawn to dusk in the broiling sun and shivering in the dank mists at night. They knew small comfort. Even by the brutal standards of the time, they were treated with severity. Holly, their wealthy master, was not ill-natured in his way, but like most of his kind, he was less interested in caring for his land than in gaming and cockfighting and in racing his blood horses against those of his neighbours. The estate was managed by Joel Lees, his factor. A tall, raw-boned tyrant with a heavy hand. Lees earned his pay. It was claimed that he could get more labour out of a servant than any other two overseers between Maryland and the Florida line. Quick with fist and foot, and the supple jack he always carried, he drove the poor slaves hard. They did not call him Bully Joel for nothing. In the warm Carolina sunshine, Guy soon grew lean and haggard with the heavy work but his muscles became steely and powerful, until he was a match for any grown man. In spite of the poor food and miserable living, he came to be tall and broad, with a lithe, supple strength that he might never have gained at home. As time went on, his friendship with the two Scots deepened. They kept apart from Exxon and his crew, the three ruffians did not interfere with them, though there was still bad blood between the two groups. One day, Guy sat with the Highlanders outside the long thatched shed in which they lived. It was a Sunday, and therefore there was no field work. The day was glorious, and they took things easily, as Bully Joel would not be alone to vex them with his fists and cane. They had just washed their clothes and were waiting for them to dry. In the warm sunshine, Guy lay back and peered through half-closed lids at his two friends. Riach was short and squat, his head and face covered with a tangle of carroty hair, through which his hot blue eyes twinkled merrily. Alistair was shaggily unkempt, like all the convicts, with a black beard and long wild hair. Yet... Even in that villainous company, he had an air of dignity and command which stamped him as a man of quality. He had birth and education. In his youth, he had studied at the University of Leiden and later had served in many campaigns with the French King's regiments. His loyalty to the Stuarts, which had made him an exile since boyhood, had now brought him to the degradation of transportation but even that could not dim his calm pride. Though Guy had no feeling for the Jacobite cause, he knew that it must have some great claim to honesty if it could hold such devotion. With thousands of others, Riach and Alistair had risked all they had to champion it, even their very lives. What was more, they loved it still. 
By and by their clothes were fit to put on, and they dressed in the shoddy rags. As they did so, they saw the dust whirl up from the trail along the river. It billowed above the cypress trees in a red fog, drifting in the sunlight. Our noble host returning with his guests, Alistair remarked. He was winning 5,000 gold guineas yesterday when that red colt of his beat Sir Willoughby Lacey's Thunderboy. Now he's bringing them all home to celebrate. The trail to the house came up from the river bank and skirted the plot where the slaves' huts lay. They could see it through the trees not far off. A gay company rode along the rutted sandy ribbon of earth. Gervais Holly sat a metal bay gelding. He wore a rich laced coat of blue and white breeches with deep deerskin boots to his thighs. He laughed and chatted to a heavy man in a plum-coloured suit. Behind them, a yellow-haired girl rode with a young dandy who was tricked out in green and silver. Guy knew the big man was Sir Robert Aubrey, a cousin of Lord Granville, who owned an enormous tract of North Carolina. Sir Robert was just out from England with his daughter Anne. It was she who now paced behind him with the foppish Sir Willoughby Lacey. Father and daughter were on their way to visit an estate far up river, which Sir Robert had just bought from his kinsman. They were staying with Mr Holly before travelling on to their own land. Watching the cavalcade, Guy thought Anne was the prettiest girl he had ever seen. Her bright hair flamed like white gold in the sunshine, unpowdered and not yet donned into the elaborate shape which her maid would have to build for the party that evening. He grinned, remembering a lady he had once seen going to a ball in Berwick. She was a fat old duck, purple with effort as she hoisted herself out of her coach. There was a model of a ship in full sail on top of her flowered wig. The street boys had hooted in their uncouth dialect, yelling that she carried too much canvas for an old craft of her beam. Behind Mr Holly and his guests came a retinue of grooms and servants, all heavily armed with muskets and hangers. A groom led the lovely chestnut colt, which had won the previous day's match. The others clustered about another lead animal, which bore twin saddlebags. The bags were stout and carefully locked and sealed. Guy knew at once that they carried the five thousand guineas which Holly was bringing from his neighbour's house. He stole a glance at Exxon and his cronies, who loafed in the shade nearby, and saw them gazing at the saddlebags with a hungry, wolfish expression. Bill Exxon and his pals have their eyes on those guineas, he chuckled. It must come hard to them to see so much money and be unable to get their paws on it. Five thousand guineas, whatever. There was a look of awe on React's bearded face. In his country, a man was rich if he could find five guineas in cold cash, leave alone five thousand. He spoke quickly in Gaelic, and Alistair laughed. Riach was saying, he should steal it and go from here, he explained. He does not like this place. No more do I, Guy agreed. Do you think there's a chance of running away? Why, it would be easy enough to run, I am thinking. Alistair's eye was still on the group of riders. It has been whiles in my mind. The horses were near the sheds now. Guy could see their hooves stir up puffs of the sand in the road, and the laughing voices of the people were plain and distinct. The cypresses threw mottled shadows across the earth, sprinkling the trail with warm, rich patches of light in between. A hog lay in the middle of the trail, fast asleep in a pool of sunlight. He did not hear the riders until they were on top of him. All at once, just as Holly's gelding drew abreast, he awoke and jumped up with a squeak of alarm, in an instant, he had darted between the horse's legs. Bedlam followed. The squeal of the pig mingled with shouts and the scuffle of plunging horses as the train of riders plunged into utter confusion. Then Guy had a vision of a cream-coloured mare flying away from the rook 
The girl sat on its back with her loosened hair waving behind her. She could not stop the brute, crazy with fright. It left the trail and tore across the open ground. In front of the huts, galloping headlong for a thicket of close brushwood and hickory. Guy began to run. If the mare took her into the thicket, it was certain that she would be knocked out of the saddle by the branches and badly hurt. At the speed she was going, those hickory limbs would strike like clubs. He had always been able to run. Now he put every last ounce he had into a frantic dash to heed the mare off. The animal was passing him at an angle. Unless he could reach her in a matter of seconds, it would be too late. The mare thundered across his front while he was still six feet away. He caught the sharp aroma of horses' sweat and heard the grunting of the mare's breath as he stretched out desperately. White-faced, the girl was soaring on the reins, but the mare had the bit and took no notice, flecking foam off the steel. He was almost too late. With a last reckless dive, he threw himself at the bridle and felt himself whirled off his feet. The earth and sky pinwheeled around him, but he hung on with all his strength, careless of the bruising he got from the animal's knees. The mare stopped in a few lengths, her sides heaving and creamed thick with lather. Guy hung on to her mane and soothed her while the others came up. The girl smiled down on him. She had white teeth and her eyes were kind. Thank you, she said in a rather breathless voice. It seems that I am much in your debt. Her eyes ran over him curiously and noted his ragged appearance with wonder and a trace of sadness. I am sure my father will reward you, so far as he is able. "'Twas little, mistress,' Guy blurted. He felt himself flush under his sunburn and the light fuzz that had covered his cheeks during the last months. "'I am glad to be of service.' By this time others were arriving. The first to reach them was a long-limbed fellow in a linen hunting shirt and buckskin leggings. He wore beaded moccasins and a long rifle swung on his back. Guy knew him already. He was Eben Willits, a hunter who had recently come out of the great wilderness of forest and hills to the westward with a pack of furs. Now he was loafing around the settlements until he had spent what the furs had bought him. Well done, Yonker, was his greeting. He grinned at Guy out of a walnut-brown face. I declare, you covered ground like a running deer. But now the others crowded on them. Sir Robert and Holly pressed towards Anne, with Lacey close behind, hot and sticky in his fine green and silver clothes. Are you safe and sound, my chick? Sir Robert was a burly, high-complexioned figure with a deep voice. His ruddy face was grave with anxiety. Zounds, I feared you were booked for a sad toss in the covert yonder. She assured him that she was unharmed. This young man stopped Zuleika just in time, Papa. I have told him that we are grateful for his aid. My thanks, fellow. Sir Robert turned his gaze on Guy. His hearty tone was not unkindly, though Guy could see that he was a trifle disconcerted at being under obligation to a convict. You behave very well upon my soul. I trust that Mr Holly will not object if I offer you a small gift for your trouble. He turned to his host, questioning. Gervais Holly smiled off-handedly. Indeed not, my dear sir. It was a plucky deed, to be sure. The fellow can run, too. Blister me if he can't. I tell you what, Lacey, I'll match him in a foot race with that Tuscarora runner of yours. What do you say? Done with you, cried the young fop in the green coat. When shall it be? We'll discuss it tonight, eh? What's this? Guy was refusing the guinea Sir Robert had tossed him. Red and confused, he faced the choleric baronet with a mumbled apology. Indeed, Your Honour, I could not. Pray forgive me. I mean no impertinence, but I would rather you did not offer it. He saw a gleam of anger kindle in the beefy face and then fade again as Sir Robert stared at him closely. Very well, the burly man answered stiffly. If you're as independent as that, I'll not force the matter. Though burn me, 
I'd have thought a man in your case would have been glad enough of a coin to spend. Are you being saucy, you knave? Holly was scandalised. To think that a servant of mine should be so churlish to my guest. Odds me life, I'll have you whipped unless you mind your loutish tongue. No, pray, do not punish him, Anne broke in, pleading. I'm sure he meant no ill. She put her hand on Holly's sleeve, and the young planter, whose mind was like a weathercock, and who could not be out of temper for lung, laughed and gave in. As you wish, Mistress Aubrey, though I'm not certain that his comb don't need clipping. With that they turned and went off towards the big house. The red colt and the pack horse, still closely guarded, followed on their heels. As they went, Guy heard the girl say something to Holly, and his careless answer. No, indeed, ma'am. He's no cut purse. I give you. A less scurvy breed than that, I faith. The lad's one of my rebels, transported for fighting his majesty. No harm in him beyond that, I dare swear. Eben Willits had loitered. He turned to look Guy up and down, while his big white teeth ripped off a chew from a plug of tobacco he pulled out of his shirt. A jack, are you? he murmured. Well, Sonny, that ain't maybe such a bad thing. Out here there's many that don't think so much of German George as all that. Him and his darn taxis. He spat and added, All the same, you was a fool not to take Sir Robert's guinea. Might come a time when you could use it good, if you had need. I don't want his money, Guy replied a little shortly. Even though I'm a convict, I don't need pay for what I did. As Alistair and Riach came up, Eben grinned again. He had a broken nose that was pushed across his face and made his mouth turn up higher at one corner than the other. Maybe, he chuckled. You ain't going to end up rich, though, if you go on that gate. Be seeing you again afore I go, I reckon. With that, he slouched off towards the house with his lung gun swinging behind his shoulder.